Hello, I'm Simon Kroon from the University of San Diego and I'm a professor of supply chain management. So the events we're seeing surrounding the coronavirus pandemic and particularly the impact on supply chains are really fascinating and potentially are giving us insights into some aspects of bulb effect that we probably don't normally see. So we've seen the phenomenon of panic buying in the stores, people buying uh, significant quantities of toilet paper. As a consequence, the store shelves are empty. However, warehouses are managing to replenish uh, relatively swiftly and manufacturing, of course, continues much at the same sort of pace. So let's think about what supply chains are. Essentially, supply chains are operations that have inputs from another operation and whose outputs go to yet another operation. So a manufacturer receives pulp, converts that into toilet paper, that output goes to the warehouse, the warehouse of output goes to the retailer and so forth. So that's what a supply chain is essentially. Now Marshall Fisher, who's a professor of operations and information management at the Wharton School, um, I think he produced probably one of the most seminal uh, papers on supply chains uh, of all time actually just a significant paper in the Harvard Business Review in 1997 and what he said was this he said that supply chains can fulfill one of two stereotypes at one extreme are the efficient supply chains for functional products fairly stable predictable demand and at the other extreme are supply chains for um, innovative products seasonal products or products that are on promotion and these require very different supply chains, very responsive or agile supply chains. Now then, when we think about functional supply chains, characteristic is that they're high volume, predictable and stable demand. And good examples would include sliced bread, hygiene products, and of course, toilet rolls. So what are we seeing in terms of supply chains? Well, let's think about some of the primary um, supply chain players in the iPhone manufacturing. When we look at the supply chain, it's relatively global. Asia, Europe, the Americas, and you know, components for the supply chain come from a multitude of different sources, aggregated at Foxconn, i.e. assembled in Shenzhen, shipped out of Hong Kong uh, airport to the US and elsewhere. Um, and I think we're probably very familiar with that supply chain. Now, Professor Jay Forrester um, had a significant impact on our understanding of supply chain dynamics. Now, what he said was that in supply chains, when we get a major concern, such as ver fluctuations here, in market demand, even for any small perturbations, we start to see major perturbations in the first tier around here. Those are amplified as we go further upstream. And that becomes a significant issue. As we get that amplification, the further away we go from the source of demand, the greater the amplification. And one of the reasons for that is people, people overreact. We see that demand does increase by 10%. They think, ah, oh, we meet, we must uh, increase our orders on our suppliers because it looks like a trend. Therefore, let's increase our supply orders by 12%, for example. And as this goes up the supply chain, we get amplification of those orders. However, we also get something called lead time offset. Lead time offset means it takes a while between when there's perturbations in the marketplace and when tier two is actually going to be responding to those signals. So that lead time offset, um, and it varies depending on the supply chain, means that we're trying to take decisions now on actions that are going to be executed in a certain time period in the future, a week, two weeks, three weeks, six weeks, and so forth. 
And this is what causes the bullwhip effect. Now, the question we have to ask is, are we seeing an increase in demand or are we seeing an increase in consumption? Now, in the bullwhip effect, we don't normally distinguish between the two. But obviously, with toilet paper, we've seen a massive increase in demand. But I'm pretty sure we're not seeing a big increase in consumption. The world hasn't suddenly become incontinent or has major digestive issues. That's not one of the symptoms, apparently, of the coronavirus. So what we're seeing is a shifting of inventory, inventory to the consumer away from the retailer. We're also aware that the supply chain for toilet paper tends not to be global. It's just not cost effective to manufacture toilet paper in China and ship it unless you have no natural resources. So, for example, in Australia, a significant proportion of their toilet paper does come from China. But in the United States, the majority of toilet paper is domestic. So what we then see is this. We see that, yes, demand is increasing thanks to panic buying and more importantly, thanks to lack of control over sales quantities. So I've been to Costco twice in the last week and on both occasions, people have been coming out with carts full just of toilet paper. No constraint on consumption. It's highly unlikely, however, that that consumption is increasing and replenishment of those stocks, those inventories, will follow at the usual, i.e. average production rate. So what are we seeing with toilet paper? Are we seeing bulb perfect or are we seeing the pig in the python? In other words, a big lump of demand moving through our supply chain. Well, I don't think we're seeing the bulb perfect. I think we're seeing pig in a python. And I think what this means is that in a very short while, we'll be back to a stable state with our supply chains, particularly for toilet paper. And therefore, potentially not a major concern unless there is constraint on supply. Factories close down, close down there are no trucks on the road, the warehouses close operation, uh, then there may be a, a shortage, but we're actually switching off the supply chain at that point. What we're unlikely to see is increased amplification of the supply chain. We're not going to see the toilet paper manufacturers vastly increasing their manufacturing output. We're going to see a very short term response because it's a short supply chain. It's a domestic supply chain. Demand is increasing, but consumption is not increasing. And I think those are really important characteristics to take in, into account. What's the solution to this? Well, really, the solution was one that existed very early on. The supermarkets, the retailers have a responsibility to manage demand or manage supply to customers. Therefore, why not introduce rationing? Market mediation in terms of adjusting prices may not have helped at all. Uh, redistribution through alternate channels. Um, Costco is a warehouse operation, Sam's Club. Walmart are warehouse operations. One of the things we, we see is that a lot of smaller stores still have supplies of toilet paper, not interrupted at all. Um, so this is an opportunity for the manufacturers to think about not an omni-channel approach, but a multi-channel approach. And of course, prioritizing users. What about um, industrial users? What about university campuses that stay open? What about hospitals? What about uh, care homes for the elderly? What about prioritizing some consumers over others? So in many ways, the retailers in the supply chain have a major responsibility to control this pig in a python. It's very different from bullwhip. And I think that's why the phenomenon we're seeing has so many different alternative solutions and um, characteristics.